We continue our series this morning in uh, the Gospel of Luke through the hard sayings of Jesus. And uh, this morning's text will be uh, split into two readings this morning, so just to, to help things along a little bit basically is the only reason why. So Luke chapter 11, verses 33 through 36, we'll read that first and then we'll move on to the rest of the, the moment in 37 to 41. So if you could pull that up in your phone, it will be on the screen behind me hopefully. And so verses 33 of chapter 11, let's read God's word and then I'll pray for a moment as we get started. These are Jesus, this is Jesus speaking. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it in a cellar or under a basket, but on a stand, so that those who enter may see the light. Your light is the lamp of your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light, but when it's bad, your body is full of darkness. Therefore, be careful lest the light in you be darkness. If then your whole body is full of light, having no part dark, it will be wholly bright, as when a lamp with its rays gives you light. Let's pray. Father, we uh, thank you for this, the Son that you've given. We thank you for the words that he has spoken, and we pray that your Spirit would apply them, teach them, speak them to our hearts, we pray. In Jesus, your mighty name, amen. The words that Jesus gives here are mysterious, they are abstract, and they are likely confusing, as you've read them with me. And I've read them every day for a while now, and I was just thinking every time I'd read them, what it's like for you to hear them once. And so I know that that's difficult to read words like this. Sometimes they're a little bit clearer as Jesus speaks, and sometimes they're not. And so I know that this might be one of those where it's hard to know where do we begin. Um... If I was to pick you up and to drop you in any time, in any culture, any place of the world, and you were to have to have a conversation about spiritual matters with someone, how would you make a connection? Where would you start? What words would you use? If you had to talk about uh, the spiritual goal of life, where you're headed, what you are and where you want to be, and you had to have a spiritual conversation How would you discuss this idea of transformation, of change? Uh, I don't think there's any easier set of images to use than the two that Jesus gives, darkness and light. And so on the first reading, it's confusing what Jesus says here, and I'm sure it's puzzling. They are deep, poetic words. What is Jesus getting at? But let's just keep with this picture for just a moment that there are two images that he's using, and they paint for you a picture that I think as you grasp it, you will begin to hear what Jesus is declaring in this moment. Now, many in our world would say that there isn't uh, just a black and white world that you live in, that you live in a various shades of gray in this life. But as soon as you leave that lecture hall, you all uh, imagine in your heart say, not really. There is darkness in this world, and there is light, and I would rather it be filled with light. There is darkness, there is light. From your kids that are uh, scared of the darkness at night to your friendships that when they begin to keep you in the dark and you know it's broken, to that depression that hangs over you like a dark cloud, we feel that darkness is real, that the world we live in and the world that's in your heart is dark. And the contrast to that, we also know that there is light, that there is hope that we can think about, hope of change, just like the, the dawning of the light of a new day or that light that's at the end of the tunnel through this experience you're going through. We know there's darkness. We know there's light. So when Jesus speaks about wanting your whole body or your whole life to, uh, to be filled with light that shines out, we can agree. I want that. And so this poetic portray- portrayal of, of righteousness and a goodness and a beautiful life we can say, yes, I want that. And, and we, we seem to understand these two universal concepts that point to the essence of what we are and the essence of what we want to be, that we want our light, lives to, to be like a light that shine out to our world. We, we, want, uh, we want that kind of light. And even when Jesus says this thing, he says, Take, no one takes a lamp and lights it and then covers it up. Uh, it's like going, no one's going to go down to your basement, open the door to the basement, to the cellar, let's say, turn on the light, then close the door, and then go back to the kitchen. Like, it's just silly, is what he's saying. No one takes a light and then puts it underneath baskets. 
And we can't help but agree with these this sort of the silly thought that Jesus is presenting that we want our light to shine out. We want the world that we're living in to be light, lit up by our lives. And so Jesus says, let me tell you about the source of where you're shining. Let me tell you about the source of where your light's going, where it's come from. Your lamp, he says, your light is your eye. And again, we're a little confused. He's speaking about your literal physical eyes. Why would Jesus say this? Well, he's not speaking about our literal physical eyes. It's not that he's, he's saying that we're like R2-D2 and the lights go off and you just turn your little eye into a light and it shines through the room. He's saying, no, that the term, the word eye here is a description of your inner eye. Your inner eye, the, the, steering, the steering center of your soul, or you could describe it as your heart, your motivation center, the core of your being, the source of all your desires. And so the language very much connects to the language that was used of Adam and Eve in the garden. When they saw the forbidden fruit, what did it say? They saw the forbidden fruit that God said, do not to eat, and they said that it was pleasing to the eye, and desirable for knowledge. The inner desire, the eye of your heart. And so that's the same language that's being used here. It, it's what moves you, it's what motivates you from deep within, and that's what leads to the various actions of your life, the very effects of your life. And so our eye is the lamp of your body, and so what you see with the eye of your body is what you really desire, and what you really desire, what really motivates you to action and to the life you live. It's what shines out of you. And so what Jesus is saying here is that all of us are creatures of this inner desire. I think that makes sense. And so where our heart is, he's saying, that's where your life will be. Where your desires are, that's where your life will go. So far, so good. But now Jesus gives us the hard word. The difficult words begin. Verse 34, when your eye is healthy, your body is full of light. But when it is bad, your body is full of darkness. Therefore, be careful lest the light in you be darkness. It's a warning, right, that you can hear Jesus giving. If your eye is good, then your desires, your inner source of motivation are healthy, and then therefore your light will shine out as it should. But if there's sickness there, if there's evil there, if there's a badness there, then what will flow out of you, what will you emit from your life is actually darkness. And then the final word of verse 35 is therefore be careful. Be careful lest the light in you be darkness. This is a, it's a warning, and it's describing Jesus and giving a hard word, but it's actually a pastoral word to the crowd that's listening to him. He's telling them to focus inward, to pay special attention, to give real care to their inner desires, their eye of their heart, the desire center of their soul, the motivations that are coming forth from there, because he says what might be coming out of you isn't light, but darkness. You might find that you, you thought you were healthy, but you were actually sick. You thought you were being so good, but you were actually being evil. You thought you were shining light, but you're actually living in darkness. And with all of this that Jesus is saying, it, it leads to a strong warning, but surely the crowd would ask, and surely what you and I might ask is, well, who is he speaking about here? What does this actually mean? Where do you see this happening? We can get the principle that we want our lives to shine out like a light, a lamp. We get the idea that maybe that our, our lives radiate naturally uh, something. And we also can understand a little bit the predicament that there could be a possibility that you, uh, you thought you were shining out light, but actually there's something darker going on. But we're still left with the question of moving from the principle of what Jesus is speaking about to the actual people he's talking about. And that's where Luke takes us absolutely next. And this blurry, poetic description of what Jesus is saying is actually pointed at a group of people who need to hear it all the more. And that's where we see in Luke 11, verse 37. Jesus is here, and the moment, actually, the moment he's speaking all these words, he gets a dinner invitation to a party. And it's, led, it's hosted by a Pharisee. And a Pharisee, you may know already, is a, is a religious leader of that day. He, uh, a, a Pharisee would be a first century prominent Jewish leader. He would have been easily the most respected person in that community. People would have been ecstatic to get an invite to go to the party. 
They were uh, the most well-respected, therefore the most powerful socially. They are like the pastors of that community, the ministry leaders, uh, the morally uh, upright, as all would think. And they would see them as the brightest people in the room shining. And they'd say, Jesus, you got an invite to the best person we could hope that you get invited to. You're going to love seeing the light shine out of this guy going to this party. But something actually quite shocking happens at this party that Jesus attends. As soon as it begins, he ends it, Jesus does, with the words he's about to drop some of the most awkward confrontational truth bombs ever to be detonated by Jesus. And he will, and we're going to be spending both this week and next in all of the texts that we get that Jesus is going to say at this party. And so we'll just be reading a little bit of it this morning. But Luke uh, chapter 11, verse 37, let's continue to read what happens. While Jesus was speaking, a Pharisee asked him to dine with him. And so he went in and reclined at table. And the Pharisee was astonished to see that he did not first wash before, he, before dinner. And the Lord said to him, Now you, Pharisees, clean the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. You fools! Did not he who made the outside make the inside also? But give as alms those things that are within, and behold, everything is clean for you. So picture the scene. The meal has been set. Uh, There were clearly more guests than just Jesus invited to the party, and they all begin to arrive. But before dinner begins, a line has formed. A line has formed near the the entrance of the dining area, and there are some specific wash basins there, all set up as each of these professionals in the ministry, these pastors and teachers, these Pharisees, would approach uh, this cleansing rite and participate in this ceremonial washing. And it was one that was not popularized by Bonnie Henry. It was not uh, for cleanliness and safety. It was not the washing of hands like surgeons, you know, reciting the ABCs before you came to dinner. The intent of this washing was actually to do so in such a way as to cleanse off of you the spiritual grime that comes upon you from the world. That was its point. It was developed by the traditions up to that point over the last number of years to this moment, and it wasn't cultural. It wasn't a cultural expression. That wasn't its main goal. Its goal was spiritual. Its goal was to say, this is the way that you and I can make ourselves acceptable and righteous in God's eyes and keep it that way. And a side benefit of it all was that it was very visible. So the better you did it, the better you thought other people thought of you, and they probably did. It's a side benefit. And so in this moment, it's so shocking because when Jesus arrives, what does he purposely do? He walks right past the religious lineup, and he takes a seat. And immediately all the eyes watching him see this guest of honor Absolutely is the most dishonored guy in the room. The Pharisee in verse 38 was astonished to see that he did not first wash before dinner. And so in the age of this COVID cleanliness, uh, we often would feel just as astonished when our kids showed up and they go, did you wash your hands before dinner? And then go, go wash your hands and use sanitizer. But that's not what's happening here. Uh, The Gospel of Mark uh, has a moment in chapter 7. Again, it's describing this washing controversy. And there they're speaking about the disciples who they say ate with hands that were uh, defiled, that were unwashed. And it won't be on the screen, but I'm going to read to you what it has from Mark 7. It says, because Mark gives this extra bit of commentary to describe what's happening. He says, For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands properly, holding to the traditions of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash And there are many other traditions that they observe, such as the washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. Interesting. I don't remember the last time I washed my couch. And so the Pharisees, they describe this, and they were talking in Mark about the disciples. Why do your disciples not walk according to the traditions of the elders and eat with defiled hands? 
So you see, Jesus could very well have clean hands physically, but when he didn't do the ceremonial washing that the Pharisees had not just, they were not just culturally shocked, they were spiritually shocked. How could this holy and undefiled man now make himself unholy and defiled before God? Jesus, you're unclean. But back to the verses, remember, everyone's lamp is their heart. Be careful, lest the light in you be darkness. I've heard it said that Jesus saves his harshest critiques for the most religious, and I would say that that is true. As Jesus unleashes some of the hardest words you will ever hear him say, What Jesus says to the religious, uh, though, still speaks to the irreligious, those of us who find ourselves not overly religious, even though maybe we're here today. Um, But they still speak to us, because here Jesus actually deals with a dark problem that is in all and every heart, and that that is this. It is the outside inside problem. The outside inside problem. Verse 39, and the Lord said to him, now you Pharisees clean the outside of the cup and of the dish, but the inside are, is full of greed and wickedness. You fools, did not he who made the outside make the inside also? And so what makes Jesus so deeply offen- offended here in his day, and what I find is deeply offensive by many people as they look at Jesus, is how Jesus constantly insists on the morality that, was, uh, that the morality of the life should be motivated from the ins- and inspired from the deepest levels of your heart. That makes deep, Jesus deeply frustrating, that he would see morality is, is canceled if it doesn't come from a right reality of the heart. That the eye of your desires, the, the lamp of your life, that inward place of you, you must look at that and get a true measure of what's there, even if it's frightened, frightening to see. It makes Jesus deeply confronting. And so here it is that the religious leaders of his day reveal that they were more impressed with the status of outward morality on the outside that could be measured, that could be detailed in ritual, that could be a regimented set of rules for all to see. And so they looked to these outer washings that uh, perhaps began because of the washings that were done at the temple in Jerusalem. They added those washings to dinner, to home life, to bed, to rising in the morning, to washing cups, plates, and couches. And so as you look at all these efforts that they were actually employing, this pathway develops, this way develops, this process develops, and it's all completely outward, and it all is around the same goal. How do I stay holy with God? And the ex-Pharisee Paul, the Apostle Paul, is probably the best to give us a synthesis of what's happening here. In chapter 10 of Romans, for I bear witness to them, he says, that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God, they sought to establish their own, and they did not submit to God's righteousness. So the Pharisees are shocked by Jesus, breaking their own outward rules that they have established for seeking and keeping righteousness because they look to the outside measure. But Jesus wants to shock them all the more now by what he says. What does he say next? You fools, you fools, do you not realize that God sees the heart, that God sees the lamp, the inner eye of your life, and He sees underneath your religion. He is the one who sees that it's not light that's there, it's actually darkness. Because inside, He says, is a full of all manner of greed and wickedness. Why is that? Well, because they're busy seeking to buy God's smile like it was an earthly possession. They were seeking to twist the arm of the Almighty by the rules of their own creation. They were seeking to make themselves look good to God by also making themselves look deeply good to others. And which one took priority? And so Jesus says, your outward righteous acts are sinful because of your inward unrighteous reasoning. You are not pleasing God, you're pleasing self, and God sees it. And so here and forever, Jesus reveals that often the most religious of us 
uh, the pastors of our lives, the teachers of our lives, those who are committed to morality the most are often the most, uh, they have mostly, they have a great heart-killing, moral, spiritual pit that we often fall into being the most judgmental, self-important, and prideful people in the room. And so if you are successful in, our, in religious behavior modifications in your life, then pride becomes inevitable because we believe that we've earned God's approval by our efforts, and we begin to look down on others who don't have their act together like, our, like we do. It's an outside, inside problem. And it's in all religion. If you don't uh, pray a certain way, dress a certain way, sing a certain way, do your devotions in the Bible a certain way at a certain time, if you don't face a certain way when you pray, if you don't meet this requirement that we've set up. And so religious people, they don't actually, they do this, but they don't have the market cornered on uh, self-righteousness. Anytime a person, anytime one of us sets up an outward standard to judge our world around us on, we enter the same territory. We may not say we see others as unclean or unholy or unspiritual, but we use other terms like there's something lacking with them. There's uh, something ignorant about them. There's something wasteful about their life. There's something uh, unworthy. There's something harmful that they're doing to the world. And how we might be setting up standards of outward appearance and then judging ourselves as righteous and others as unrighteous, how might you and I be setting up outward laws and judging people as worthy or unworthy? Uh, we all tend to, treat, to create outward standards and measures of uh, other people by that standard. So it could be political you know, political righteousness, where you say, I would never uh, support a federal budget like that. I can't believe they're spending money on these kinds of things. They're just, they should be doing this instead of that. How could they forget that sector of society for so long and not deal with this? They must be morally bankrupt, unlike I am. How could, uh, we have cultural righteousness or cultural standards. How could people waste uh, my time, waste their time? Uh, how do they, why do they work the way they, they do? Why can't they work like me? I would never say this kind of thing to someone's face like they do. Uh, that kind of cultural uh, righteousness. There's a parenting righteousness. How could you let your kids stay up that late, eat that kind of thing? Ne I would never do that. Driving righteousness, how could they drive so slow? How could they drive so fast and so inconsiderate? We have marriage righteousness. How could that couple who we had for dinner speak that way about each other? I'm so glad our marriage is not like that. Goodness gracious. We have appearance righteousness. Why is she wearing that? Don't I look good today? How could they... Do that. Wealth, right, health righteousness. How could they not take care of themselves? Where's their self-control? Why can't they do this or that or the other thing? We have health righteousness now according to all the standards in our pandemic life. And you see, what happens is that from the first century to the 21st century, we see and feel the same moral and upright behavior on the basis of our outward standards. We say, this is who has arrived and this who is who not has not. And it's this outward appearance. It's an outside the cup set of ideals and morals and activities and phrases that send out our personal version of a virtue signal to let everyone know that we're more righteous than the person next to us. And so what does Jesus say to us? Be careful, lest the light in you actually is darkness. You see, Jesus has found something wrong in us. What has he found? In the starkest terms, he says it, I've found fools. Don't you see that there is an inside that accompanies the outside? And in fact, that is the inside that God can see. What is the greatest sin of all? Many people have discussed this question, like what is the chief sin, the, the major sin, but Pride, that spiritual dark self-love, has to be near the top. 
And what better fuels our spiritual pride than to focus on the outward lists of what makes us feel so right, so much better, so much smarter, so much more capable than the rest of people around you? And Jesus says, you fools, can't you see? God sees underneath it. He sees the lamp. He sees the eye. He sees the inner desires of your life. And he sees the darkness that's there. And God sees that while that's all hiding, he sees the reasons for all that you say, think, and do. Now, if this cuts to the heart, and it should, for that's why Jesus went to the party. If this cuts to the heart and, and you, maybe like someone in that party, were willing to, to raise their hand before leaving the party and say, Jesus, Jesus, I see my pride. I see a lot of self-love in my life. I see a lot of self-righteousness. I, I'm ruled by a thousand standards of what I think of other people and what I think of myself. I can't see straight. And I know there's something deep and dark inside me that's blocked me from worship and joy and a sense of acceptance in God's eyes and the grace of God. I think something is broken. What am I to do? Jesus answers you. Verse 41, but give as alms those things that are within and behold, everything is clean for you. Alms are mercy gifts, right? They're given acts of gifts. They're gifts to the poor. But Jesus says here that there's a way to do that on the inside. To give and to give over your inward life. Of course, we think about that and what he's just said. What's the inward life of the people he's speaking to in the room right now? It's full of greed and wickedness. Oh, man. So what has he just told them to do? Give over your inner greed and wickedness. Repent. Turn from the inside out and let it all go to him. And there's a way to find cleanliness that will cleanse everything around. Give over this inner part of your life, your lists, your perceived righteousness, and give it all the way deep down. Give him your heart. And the eyes, that lamp of your body, give that. Give your heart to God first and freely like you would give the alms you would give to the poor. And cleanse, he will cleanse you from the inside out. And I don't have what it takes, though. I'm not good enough from the inside out. And Jesus says, give the inner part. Give your heart to him. In a room of ceremonially washed men, Jesus is actually the only clean one in that room. For his whole body is actually what he says it should be, full of light, having no part dark. He is actually wholly bright. His lamp shines rays of light that gives light to the whole room, to the whole world. As the Apostle John says of him, that he is a light that shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. And so we give our lives, our inner lives, to Jesus. That's what the finishing statement of the Apostle Paul in Romans 10 says. He says, you know, we used to, we were ignorant of the righteousness of God. We did not submit to the righteousness of God. But he says, we sought to establish our own. But he says, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to all who believe in him. Christ is the end of your striving for both inward and outward righteousness by the law that you cannot keep. And by giving your inner life, by giving your soul, by giving your whole life to Jesus from the inside out, not faking it till you make it, but giving your whole life to God in Christ through repentance and faith, that inner poverty, that inner uncleanliness, that inner, undef the inner defiledness of our lives can be covered in the righteousness of Christ through faith. How does that happen? Jesus was holy and good and right, and he came to the party of sinners, and he sat down at their party, but eventually he would take himself to the cross for those who would give their lives to him. Jesus himself is the substitute that we need, and he and his light has not been held in a cellar or under a basket, but it's put on a stand for the whole world to see. Jesus is this true light. He's given us a tough word as he's doing these week by week by week here. 
It's a tough word to be called a fool on Sunday morning. But he does so with a promise. If you give him your sin, if you place your faith in him, he will cleanse you of your foolishness. He will complete you, and he promises to fill you with a light that is unquenchable, that will shine out of your life brighter than any moral standard you could keep trying to add to yourself. He will change you from the inside out into overflowing. Believers, have you settled this morning for trying to fix yourself yet again instead of submitting to the gift righteousness of Jesus Christ that has been laid upon your account and been cleansed from the inside out? Have you begun to see people through the laws and the standards that you have set up? Why can't they get their act about it? Who can do this? Why don't they parent this way? Why don't they do their marriage this way? Have you, are you stuck in the cycle yet again of what you came out of? Hold on to the grace of Jesus Christ and the everlasting story that you were cleansed and they need the same cleansing. See people through the eyes of grace and what Jesus has come to do and what he has done. Let his light shine through you from the inside out. Let's receive it again. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for the light that you are, the light of life that cannot be quenched by the darkness that has overcome, and that we get to hold you by faith in our hearts and give you that inner part of our souls and be lit up with praise and change. We don't want to live our lives that are darkness ultimately, but that shine a light that is truly, morally, beautifully good. But what you say here and what you show here is there's only one way to get that, and it's by you. You're substituting grace in our hands placed solidly upon you by faith. And so, Lord, we, we receive you, we trust in you, take our sin, fill us with your light. We ask this in your name. Amen.